Okay, we're going to get started. On behalf of Columbia Business School and the Halbrin Center for Graham and Dot Investing, I would like to welcome everyone to the 10th annual Pershing Square Challenge. We are particularly grateful to have so many of the past winners in attendance who've come back to celebrate this milestone year. I would first like to thank Bill Ackman, whose generosity continues to make this event possible. Thank you to my team, Caroline Reichert, Jennifer Aaron, and Julia Kimiagarv, who worked tremendously to make this night a success. And finally, thank you to Professors Bhatia and Renjan, who did an excellent job teaching the students in applied security analysis throughout the semester and getting us to this point. Tonight, we will listen to five pitches, 10 minutes of uninterrupted pitches, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A from our panel of judges. The pitches that you hear tonight are the intellectual property of the students, and <clears throat> the event is entirely off the record. Good luck to all of the students. Before I turn the program over to Bill, it is my pleasure to present him with this book as a token of our thanks. In creating this book, we asked all of the past winners to talk about how this uh, event impacted their experience, and overwhelmingly, they said it was the highlight of their two years at Columbia Business School, so thank you. So I guess if the hedge fund thing doesn't work for me, I'll start a school. <laughs> so uh, this is a lot of fun for us, uh, and uh, you know, the first year of the program actually wasn't very good, to be totally honest, and uh, 10 years in, it's really become uh, a remarkable course, and that's really a credit uh, to the school and to the faculty. Uh, Naveen Bacha has played a critical role here, and uh, so we're really excited about it and excited to be a, you know, a supporter of the event. So I, as a professional in this business, I think there's no better experience you can have at business school than a class like this one, because the work you do here is very similar to the work you do if you were actually working for an investment firm. You're spending a few months studying an investment idea, uh, analyzing every element of the business, and then presenting why this is a compelling investment opportunity is basically the job of, of an analyst at uh, any investment uh, management firm. So I think it's a real, real life, very good training. And we want to make the, the evaluation of the idea as as professional as the, the work that you guys do, and, and that's a credit to a group of judges. Uh, and we brought, it, I guess, uh, 10 of them here today. I'll introduce you to the group. When I start with Jenny, if Jenny, if you don't mind standing up, this is Jenny Wood. She's from Senator. Uh, she's got a couple of roles as Senator, among them head of strategy, I think, is, is one of them. Uh, Paul Sonkin is a uh, stand up, Paul, uh, is a Columbia Business School native, actually was involved in. Were you teaching this class way back when at some point, or you were involved in some capacity? Talk the second year of the course, okay? First year. First year wasn't that good. The second year, <laughs> we saw a dramatic improvement in the second year. Okay, and uh, Nishi Shah, if you wouldn't mind. So Nishi comes from uh, on her career trajectory, you know, down here she was at Soros. Now she's at a new firm called Cold? Old Farm. O old Farm. So Old Farm versus Soros is no comparison. Uh, and Old Farm is a firm that... Um, allocates money to hedge funds, so if you're thinking about starting a hedge fund, you should be very nice to her. Uh, and they also uh, invest in co-investment opportunities, uh, so uh, that's uh, Nishi. Uh, Craig Nuremberg, I've known practically since his birth, uh, but actually he came to work for me for the summer when he was 16, and now he's managed his own firm with a billion-ish in assets under management. He's done a great job, and I was a day one investor, and that, how long ago was day one? 12 years ago. He's been in business 12 years, which is, that's a real history. Anthony Massaro. <clears throat> um, so Anthony is the person to blame if your idea was not selected to be in the top five. Anthony works at Pershing Square, uh, where he's a, oh, there are some people giving you some very uh, bad looks from the audience. Uh, uh, but Anthony actually did go through all of the, all, and to, to, to pick the top uh, five. So he's the person you should either thank, or there's a greater number of people here who don't like you. Uh, be careful of them on the way out. Uh, Martin Brand uh, at uh, Blackstone. Um, Martin, what do you do at Blackstone? Uh, runs tech and financials. So tech and financials, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, Scott Ferguson, uh, Scott, why don't you stand up? I always used to make fun of Scott because he always reminded me of Thurston Howell, uh, <laughs> and he dresses the part. Uh, Scott and I really founded Pershing Square. He was the first uh, analyst and like the third employee uh, and then uh, he left Pershing about five, five years ago and started Sachem Head Capital, and he's done a great job. And one of the things we, we, it's important to Pershing Square 
is one, that you do a great job when you're at Pershing Square, and two, you do a great job when you leave, if you leave, and uh, we want a place where you can learn a lot and build a track record, and then if you know it's your dream to run your own firm, you can leave and do that, and it uh, enables us to attract other talented young people. At one point in Scott's life, he was a talented young person. <laughs> uh, Keith, <laughs> yeah. So Keith Meister, uh, I made fun of Keith. I remember it last year. You know, if you choose to work for Carl Icahn, that's what you'll look like, um, <laughs> and then <laughs> all your hair will go. Uh, and uh, mine just turned gray when I met him. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Keith runs a, a very successful activist firm. Uh, Phil Halal. Uh, Phil, I got to know uh, Paul Halal's brother. Paul, uh, obviously very involved at Columbia, actually got us interested originally in doing this uh, program. Paul wanted to be here tonight, but he couldn't make, uh, you know, his flight came in late and he wasn't able to get here on time. So 10 judges. Uh, I think we should launch the program, but we really had two objectives in this program. The idea here was, one, it's a great class to learn about investing. And Naveen, I forgot the name of your co-teacher because I want to thank him as well. Rishi from Maverick Capital, Capital, a superb firm. Uh, also, rumor has it, uh, did a great job uh, co-teaching this, uh, this course. But the idea was to teach about investing. And the, 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 you know, this is a business where if you're successful, uh, you know, the, reward, the economic rewards are, are very large. And the thought I had was it would be great to start learning about philanthropy as well. And so this is both a class about investing and in some sense about philanthropy. So the prize. I think we started out, the original prize was 25,000. Uh, we raised it to 100,000, which shows inflation. Um, even, pretty good on an inflation adjusted basis, actually, because <laughs> it hasn't been much of that. But uh, the students get to decide what they do with the money. So you can keep the prize, uh, you can give the prize to a Columbia University charity, or you can do something in the middle. Uh, most people hedge by doing something in the middle. Uh, my experience is uh, the more money I gave away, the more I made. Uh, that was, it hasn't worked that way in the last year or so, but uh, I'm a long-term investor. <laughs> Our Keith's point is I'm not giving away enough. <laughs> uh, but I do think that uh, it's, I remember when uh, I committed publicly to give away any profits I made on our short on MBIA, because at that point, you know, the stock only went in one direction. Everyone said, well, we can't believe you because you're going to make all this money. And the stock, that was when the stock hit 72. It was literally the high. And from that day going forward, it went to zero. And I committed to give away all the money. And it's very easy to commit to give away money when you don't have it. And then we made it, I made a personally $150 million in the MBIA short. And that became uh, really a launching pad for the Pershing Square Foundation. And we've made over $400 million of grants in the last uh, 10 years. It's also the 10th anniversary of the Pershing Square Foundation. We're going to have a little event uh, in June about that. Anyway, I'm sure you're waiting to hear some great ideas. Why don't we get started? What's that? It was actually 150 last year. Oh, we gave 150 last year. Oh, okay. So actually, I think what we did last year, we raised it to 150. It was 150. 150. So only a first and a second prize. So we're not going to go backwards. So it's 100,000 first prize, 50,000 second, and there is no. And someone owes you a beer, and there is no such thing. It's like no one remembers who won the bronze. Okay. It's gold or silver or go home. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for hosting us at this venue, and thank you for organizing this competition. My name is Chris Waller. These are my colleagues, SK and HK. Uh, airlines are very much topical right now, and today we're going to pitch along on Alaska Air, which we see as having 150% upside over the next five years. 
Our thesis is simple. We think the street underestimates how much market share Alaska will profitably gain over the next five years. Specifically, we model California to be an incremental $3 billion opportunity, and that's on company revenues currently at $7.6 billion. There are four reasons why the street is too pessimistic. One, Alaska's costs are lower than the street realizes, and this will enable it to gain more market share. Two, because of this, the street also underestimates how much capacity Alaska could gain at key airports. Three, like railroads, the airline industry has consolidated and we see structurally high margins going forward. And four, an activist investor could help Alaska realize its potential to become the dominant West Coast player. Alaska is a low cost provider in a commodity industry. It owns Alaska Airlines, Horizon Air and Virgin America, making it the fifth largest carrier. Its strategy is to be a national carrier for the West Coast customers. And as such, it has dominant shares in Alaska, Washington and Oregon, but not in California. Its low cost structure gives it the highest returns and margins in the industry. On to thesis point one, the street considers Alaska to be a mid cost carrier, but our analysis reveals it actually has the lowest costs amongst its competitors. If you look at the top right here, you'll see reported cost per available seat mile or chasm. This is what the street looks at. You take OPEX divided by available seat miles and you get reported chasm or 10.4 cents for Alaska. That means it costs Alaska 10.4 cents to fly one seat one mile. We think it's very misleading to make an apples to apples comparison on this because there are several factors we should adjust for. We do this in our normalized chasm. We take mainline OPEX, which excludes some very short distance regional flights often within one state. We divide by mainline available seat miles and then we adjust for flight length and for the allocation to economy, business and first classes. If you do this analysis for all the carriers, you get the chart on the left, which shows that Alaska has a 7% cost advantage over Southwest for the same economy seat on the same flight length, and an even bigger advantage over American, Delta, and United, its main competitors. The adjustment for the seat allocation is crucial and something the street isn't doing because it is somewhat subjective. Let me explain this slide step by step. We looked at aircraft trade journals for each type of plane, for example, Boeing 737s, and we found the space allocated to each class for each type of plane. We then mapped this to the fleets of each carrier. If you look at the middle two red boxes, you'll see that Alaska's fleet typically has 74% of space allocated to economy class, 11% to business, and 15% to first class. In comparison, Southwest allocates 93% to economy. Now, a first class seat on an Alaskan flight takes twice as much space as an economy seat. And so naturally they fit less seats on the same plane and so the reported cost per seat is going to be higher. But that doesn't necessarily reflect an inherent cost disadvantage. What we really want to know is if they both allocated 93% to economy seats, what the cost would be. That's exactly what our class adjustment of 1.17 times does. It says if Alaska allocated all of its space to economy, it would have 1.17 times more seats than it currently does. This is really important because in a commodity industry, it is the low cost player who ultimately gains share and profits. To test whether our model works in practice, we wanted to look at costs for different airlines on the same routes. That data is not publicly available, but what we can look at are prices. On the right, you will see we looked at the Department of Transport and Transstat and found 19 routes where Alaska and Southwest overlapped. This showed that Alaska's prices were on average 6% higher than Southwest, which is almost identical to the 5% that our model predicts. In other words, we're very confident in our model because this out of sample test uh, comes to very similar conclusions. We can also back out that if Alaska's prices are 6% higher, but it has a 10 percentage point higher EBIT margin, it must have lower costs. This means Alaska can undercut Southwest and certainly the higher cost carriers. Its cost advantage comes from lower fuel and maintenance costs because of its homogenous and young fleet, which order books show will actually improve over the next few years, and also on crew costs because of its labor contracts and higher productivity. Um, this is point two. Uh, we think that the street underestimates um, Alaska's growth potential in California. Uh, with Alaska's cost advantage and expanded network from uh, Virgin America acquisition, we think that Alaska has up to $3 billion revenue growth opportunity in California. Uh, let's look at um, LAX first to see how low-cost advantage um, translates into their higher um, market share. 
So the, the, uh, the version of market acquisition has made Alaska the fifth largest player at LAX with 11% market share. Uh, the, the street thinks that um, LAX is gate constrained, but our primary research uh, reveals that there are still two ways for Alaska to increase their capacity at LAX. Um, from, uh, both of these two options are based uh, because of their uh, low cost advantage. Uh, first option is to lease um, gates from other airlines. Um, from our primary research, uh, we found out that the United Airlines is currently looking to reduce their uh, foothold at LAX because of their low profitability. And uh, if Alaska could um, um, lease four gates from United, uh, we think that this would bring up to 511 million incremental revenues for Alaska. And the second option is to build a new terminal. Um, LAX has a plan to build Terminal 9 and um, traditionally, LAX chooses one airline to fund the construction and get the long-term lease for that new terminal. So uh, we think that this option makes more sense for Alaska Airlines uh, than the other airlines because, because of their low cost advantage that makes them more profitable. Um, so if they could pursue this opportunity, uh, we think that this would um, more than double their current capacity at LAX and this alone could bring um, 1.7 billion incremental revenue for the company. Moving on to the um, SF, uh, San Francisco, um, Alaska is the second largest player at SFO with 15% market share. Uh, from our uh, primary research, we found out that at SFO, the gates are strictly allocated to each airline uh, based on their um, uh, historical passenger size. And the, the airport currently is expanding to add 15 new gates by June 2019. Um, so their current um, gate allocation methodology really tells us that Alaska will be able to secure up to three new gates by uh, 2019, and we think that this will be worth about 350 million incremental revenue for the company. So we have incorporated um, all the growth opportunities in uh, California into our valuation scenario. In our bear case, we, assume, we only assume that um, organic growth, which is um, Alaska's capacity will grow in line with the traffic growth at, um, at the, um, these five airports in California. And in our base case, we assume that Alaska will uh, expand their capacity by borrowing four gates at LAX, securing three new gates at SFO, and increasing their market share in other three main uh, airports in California. And finally, for bull case, we assume that Alaska will build a new terminal at LAX instead of borrowing uh, gates from other airlines. Thank you, SK. Uh, sorry for my voice, I caught a cold today. Uh, our next thesis is that, uh, our next point is modeled into a bull case. This is that industry consolidation, sorry about it. Industry consolidation leads to higher margins. The airline industry today is similar to the railroad industry in the past, when four remaining players' margins and returns significantly increased after consolidation. Like in railroads, nine major airlines became four. This should rationalize supply and increase utilization or load factor. In the example on the right, the industry load factor increases from 84% to 89% over the next five years. This leads to higher revenues, but costs remain constant because the marginal cost of filling a, like additional, uh, like previously empty seat is almost close to zero. This result is that the 5% more increase in load factor drops through to a 37% increase in EBIT. We think this is Buffett's thesis. And while Alaska was too small for Buffett, we think it is the natural acquisition target for uh, American or Southwest. So our last thesis point is that an activist can help make the bull case and it's to 74% upside actually happen. A bull case is really the Persian case it models Alaska staying focused on the West Coast and taking steps to help rationalize the market. These include, first, swapping away some of the 50 slots gained in New York via the Virgin America acquisition. These are in demand and more valuable to airlines like United, who also fly loose like New York to London. On the other hand, United is looking to reduce gates at LAX because it cannot compete on cost. Alaska should get these in return. Second, they should consolidate the remaining slots in New York and DC into one airport for each city. Third, they should look to fit Delta and Seattle. Just to finish off on the model, um, 
we, the thing I want to get across is we really model our primary research directly in. Um, there are four main drivers. One, the incremental California sales, 1.8 billion in the base case, 3 billion in the bull case. Load factor, which we hold constant in the base case, but we increase it five percentage points in the bull. We also model pricing and cost. And just to go to the last slide, um, the punchline is we see 150% upside in the base case, and we hold the EV EBITDA multiple constant at 6.3 times because we're trying to bet on our California thesis and not multiple expansion. Um, the difference to consensus is driven by our California uh, higher revenues, and we also model EBIT margins actually declining to 18.9% from the current levels. And with that, we'd like to open to questions. I think airlines historically have been bad investments because of, you can't really differentiate on the product. Um, you don't really have um, cost, um, power over Boeing Airbus. There's lots of competition. The difference with Alaska is that it's much lower cost than other airlines, and that's really where the profitability is coming from. And I think one thing we want to emphasize is how unique the opportunity it has is. In our understanding, there's never been an airline with the opportunity to dominate a region like the West Coast. This is really a first. And what would be different is if they can do that in California and so really dominate that region and have big shares at gates both at Seattle and at LAX on a flight like that. That would translate into much higher profitability. So in your uh, – couple questions. One, on the uh, – when you gave, a, I think, a comparison between Alaska and Southwest, you – concluded that their, their pricing, I think, was higher by 5 or 6%. Is that correct? Yes. But you say they have a, a, they had a cost advantage. Why are they pricing uh, 5 or 6% higher when they have a 7% cost advantage? What's the... So Alaska has a significantly better product. Um, I don't know if you've been on um, one of their flights, but it, if you look at different... <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What I meant by that is, if you look at different uh, quality metrics, Alaska tends to finish top, um, Alaska and Virgin American tends to finish top on most of them. And so it's able to price just a little bit higher. I mean, 7% higher you know, on a $150 ticket is only um, sort of $10 or so. Um, and it's taken a strategic decision that it can just price a little bit higher and still get those customers. Um, but I think the main point we want to say is, we see it gaining share really from Delta, United, and American. We wanted to compare it to Southwest because they're the next lowest cost. And we wanted to show you um, that the so-called low-cost carrier uh, is actually not as low-cost as Alaska. Other question, and then I'll, I'll hand it to someone else. You, you talked about the kind of incremental revenues that come from a gate acquisition, et cetera. Can you just take us through, I couldn't find in your presentation the math on how you calculate, what's the basis for the revenue Assumption. Do you want to, should we go to that slide? Go to the slide. Uh, maybe next slide. Just let me hold on, go to the main bit. Do you want to talk to us? Yeah. Um, so our main assumptions for the gate acquisition, uh, the incremental revenue calculation is that, uh, first of all, the, the ticket price is actually um, their um, average ticket price from uh, each of these airports. And what we got uh, this data from the, uh, the, um, the Department of Transportation, uh, uh, which uh, they, uh, the, the department discloses the, uh, uh, the, the ticket price for uh, each airline at, the, uh, at, the, at each different airport. And uh, we, um, for, um, so for, for, so for, so for, so Let's look at the LAX first. So we started from, we first uh, estimate the revenue for uh, 2021 uh, LAX revenue based on, uh, you, uh, based on the assumption that they only have nine gates and uh, which is their current number of the gates at LAX. And we projected out their um, revenue uh, for 2021 and we, uh, based on the assumption that they're gonna have four new gates, we 
uh, simply uh, uh, divide the uh, 2021 revenue by nine gates and uh, multiply the four, t uh, four gates, uh, which will be the uh, incremental revenue from the uh, gate um, acquisition at LAX. And this is based on the assumption that they're gonna have the same uh, number, um, same load factor um, at the um, at this airport. So, so effectively, we know that LAX has grown historically at 5.17%. So we project that forward five years. We then go the average ticket price. I think is $168 uh, on an Alaska flight out of LAX. We then say, well, how many gates does LAX have in total? If we uh, so, so do four divided by that and multiply by the 168, that gets the incremental revenue number. What is the airline's policy uh, for removing passengers from aircraft <laughs> when, when they're overbooked? I think they try not to let them on kidding, in the first place. A <laughs> uh, serious question is, uh, you, you draw a comparison between the airlines and the railroads, and I, and I think that it's an apt comparison. It's one that uh, people have suspected Buffett might be thinking because he's shown up as a large shareholder of many of the airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the great things about the railroad industry is that uh, railroads have very strong market positions within certain portions of their customer base, such that um, you know they, they might even be have captive customers that have no alternative source of transportation. Uh, airlines are a little bit different because they're network businesses, and in recent quarters, we've actually seen some announcements of capacity additions from um, some of the legacies. Uh, and partly for that reason, yields have been softer than expected, and some of the stocks have traded off. Um, could you help me understand what gives you confidence that e even in a consolidated industry structure, given that they're so competitive on a micro level and they've got mobile assets that can serve any market, what gives you so much confidence that the price umbrella from the legacies will protect uh, profitability? I think there's probably two things we'd want to point to. One. Um, 40% of Alaska's revenues come from loyalty customers, and that compares to 15% on average for other airlines. So when you, I think the point about having captive customers, you know, people who are, who are loyalty card members tend to be much more captive to an airline and much more profitable. And so because Alaska has the 25 percentage point higher loyalty customers, that gives it a much higher amount of captive customers. I think the second thing we talk about is, if we look at the European market, We've seen a similar situation develop, but actually maybe a little bit um, further ahead in, than the US uh, in regards to how much share low-cost carriers have gained. So in Europe, low-cost carriers were at about 15% market share about 10 years ago. And in the most developed markets, um, in terms of low-cost carriers like the UK and Spain, you've seen that share go up to 40% now and, and kind of stabilize at that region. In the UK, EasyJet and Ryanair have about 20% each, and British Airways is, is the high cost player. So I think that gives us confidence that there's a historical precedent um, for these low-cost carriers really gaining that share and, and having those captive customers. Hey, uh, one, one quick thing on, on the uh, terminal expansion. Like, who, who, I guess, is that definitely happening? And uh, wh why is Alaska the one who's going to be the likely? You know, it seems like that creates a lot of value, obviously, the way you guys have modeled it. Well, why them, not somebody else? And I guess if you're, if you're tacking on, to me, that seems like it would be incremental capacity coming to the market. Um, do you think it's, you know, wh where are those flights going? Do you think it's like adding more density on? routes where they're already pretty dominant, or like how, how does that all happen, do you think? Um, so we talked to um, LAX Airport um, um, IR, and um, they actually have the plan to uh, build the Terminal 9 over the next five or six years. And the reason why we think that uh, um, Alaska is really a great um, candidate for um, getting this, um, building this terminal is that um, Alaska is currently located at Terminal 6, and United is located in ter Terminal 7 and 8. And um, uh, with the uh, current incident, uh, with the passengers, and also when we look at the, um, their uh, United's market share declining at the LAX, we think that um, um, United is not, uh, will um, most likely uh, uh, not follow the uh, pursue this opportunity, and um, also uh, one of the uh, their initiative, United's initiative, is to um, really strategically review their um, gate share uh, at each airport, and also 
they are looking to not spend more capital expenditure to um, um, optimize their uh, profitability. So um, that is the main reason why we think that the uh, Alaska is uh, is the bet, uh, I guess the best candidate among the all the uh, peers. And we only include that in our bull case. So in our base case, we assume they take the full gates from United. I'm just struggling with the duration of the of the thesis mm -hmm. in such a cyclical industry with you advocating for an activist campaign that could require a certain degree of illiquidity. So how much or how much have you sensitized your your numbers to model for a recession and what sort of defensiveness does the company have? Um, we didn't model a recession explicitly in the base case. What we did in the bear case, um, if we go to the bear case, uh, we've taken EBIT margins down to 6.9% from the current level of 22%. So we've put in a pretty aggressive uh, bear case. So I think this would show you what this uh, company's value should do in a recession. Um, and in this case, we have 16% downside using a 4.8 times EV EBITDA multiple, which is lower than the 6.3 the 6 times it currently is trading at. So. That's how we try to think about the downside. And you know, as you can see, we think it's very skewed in a positive direction. The other thing I think I just mentioned, because you mentioned the active angle, is you know, if we're correct, and this is the opportunity to become a dominant player, this story isn't over after five years, because they don't achieve dominant share within five years. So this is something that can continue for 10 years. Um, and we see this as a stock that's really going to multiply over a much longer time horizon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vic Patel. These are my colleagues Griffin Dan and Joseph Ahira, and we're here to discuss our long thesis on Corning. Corning is a $27 billion market cap glass sciences business with structural competitive advantages in its five market segments. These include display technologies, think TV screens, optical communications, think fiber optic cable, specialty materials or Gorilla Glass, your iPhone screen, environmental technologies, think diesel exhaust filters, and life sciences, think chemistry sets. We see a base case price target of $38.50 on our, based on a 17 times multiple on our 2019 EPS mess estimate, which results in a 51% total return over the next two years. This is a rare business where the whole is actually greater than the sum of its parts. Over the past 16 decades, Corning has propelled seemingly disconnected end markets by leveraging patents and technologies across its product lines. For example, the technology used to create Pyrex cookware was the same technology used in signal lanterns for trains. And by the way, when you checked your email before you got on stage, you were actually interacting with three different Corning technologies all at the same time. Gorilla glass, display substrates, and fiber optic cable. Our thesis can be bucketed into three major themes. First, this business and its earning assets are being undervalued. Second, ROIC expansion through balance sheet optimization and organic growth supports multiple expansion. And finally, the market is myopically focused on display and missing what really matters for the future, which is the growth of optical and Gorilla glass. This growth in the gorilla and optical segments, combined with the company returning 27% of its market cap, will result in a 13% EPS CAGR over the next three years. As you can see, over the past 10 plus years, the stock has moved on to developments in display glass fundamentals. While this made sense when display was over 70% of gross profit, the market is just now starting to recognize that secular growth in optical fiber and new markets for gorilla glass, are, will, and new markets for gorilla glass will drive this company's cash flow in the future. Great, so I'm going to talk to you guys about our first thesis, which is valuation. Corning has publicly committed to returning all excess cash to shareholders in an aggressive capital return policy over the next three years. By our, cap by our calculations, that's 27% of the current market capitalization of the company. 
So if I was a private equity investor and I was buying this company, I realized I can make the purchase, pocket the excess cash, and realize an adjusted purchase price multiple of 13.6 times PE. For public market investors, this sentiment still makes the same sense, right? Because that excess cash is going to be returned to shareholders, implying the market will be forced to fully value the true cash generating assets of this business. So I've kind of gotten into detail why, we, why the stock is cheaper than it appears, but now we want to talk about how Corning deserves a higher multiple driven by an increase in return on invested capital. So this expansion on return on invested capital can be bucketed <coughs> into three categories, and the first two lie on the balance sheet. So this is a company that's earning into its DTA, it's returning excess cash, and both those account for roughly a third of that expansion. But also, Corning as a business has a really unique proposition that it can increase sales without much incremental capex spend in some of its divisions. A really great example of that is in the auto glass manufacturing side, where the company is going to be able to generate $400 million in incremental sales without any incremental capex and pp and &E. So as you can see here on a long-term basis, the, long, the forward multiple tracks the direction of, of the company's return on invested capital, which is clearly inflecting upwards. We believe this trend will continue for the reasons we've discussed, and as a result, we think a 17 times earnings is not only justified, but it's slightly conservative. Great. So the final leg of our thesis kind of dives into this organic growth. First, in the display segment that everyone's so focused on, Corning is dominant and highly competitively advantaged. Their patented fusion manufacturing process allows them to maintain profitability by increasing the efficiency of their tanks at a rate that's as fast, if not faster, than the low single-digit price declines that we normally see in this market. Also, while competitors used to have operating margins in the 20s, they now barely break even and are in no position to start a price war anytime soon. Now, the optical segment seems complex, but it's actually quite simple. Essentially, you have long-haul communications, which is city to city or coast to ho coast to coast. And then there's backhaul net networks, which are like the connection between a big node to your home office or a cell tower. As you can see in the bottom right of this slide, Corning's value proposition in backhaul is powerful. Essentially for a higher upfront cost, you, Corning offers a, to a lower total cost of ownership for a longer product life cycle, improved network security, and virtually unlimited bandwidth. Now, based on widespread market commentary, carriers will continue to shift their mix of CapEx spending towards Corning's value-added products. As this has happened historically, Corning has gained market share amongst carriers like Verizon, AT&T, and others. We believe this trend will only accelerate going forward because Corning is the high-quality supplier, because Corning is a high-quality supplier in a highly inelastic market with little spare capacity. In fact, as fate would have it, just yesterday, Corning announced a major deal with Verizon to supply 12.4 million miles of optical fiber for a billion dollar minimum commitment um, as an initial stage in Verizon's 5G rollout. Now, the largest opportunity is in Gorilla Glass for autos. We believe the market's not factored this into their estimates at all because of the sheer size and complexity of the opportunity. However, with a little bit of logic and a lot of phone calls, the opportunity becomes much more readily apparent and easier to frame. First, it's important to understand how vastly superior Gorilla Glass is versus the traditional soda lime product. Substituting Gorilla Glass can cut a car's weight by one and a half percent, double the strength of the windows, and triple the visibility and clarity for the driver. Now keep in mind, this is a market that hasn't seen major innovations for 65 years. So Gorilla Glass is a truly revolutionary product. Now, through our discussions with, Corning, with Corning's chief strategy officer, as well as auto OEM procurement officers, existing suppliers, and others in this market, we developed this S-curve framework to kind of help us model out the adoption. Now, Gorilla Glass is already in six cars, but OEMs have been actively considering where to add it in their lineup for a number of years. This adoption that we've seen so far is the thing before the thing. Full penetration is several years out, but the market will start to discount this opportunity as it becomes more obvious over time, well before the full P&L impact. You have the opportunity, however, to buy this now. Full penetration will result in a doubling of Corning's total consolidated revenues. While that sounds like a mind-boggling statement, everyone we spoke to in the entire auto supply chain industry, whether they liked it or not, fully expected them to achieve this goal. If you're only focusing on the display segment and iPhones, you'll never see this coming. 
Now, that said, we'd be remiss uh, if we didn't at least mention that we're still going to see significant growth in Gorilla Glass's existing markets, um, especially with the widely expected all-glass iPhone 8 and in display with uh, TV screens continuing to grow. Now, there are a few risks to our thesis that we want to highlight and um, as well as why they don't really shake our conviction. Display substrates are largely sold out of Japan and the stock has, been, has historically been more volatile around periods of yen weakness. However, these tend to be temporary dislocations as the company is fully hedged through 2022. We believe the risk of OLED screens overtaking the LCD market is limited to smaller form factor devices as large, um, as large screen OLEDs are fairly uneconomic. And finally, the display segment is somewhat pro-cyclical um, as it's become more mature. However, the business is shifting towards, more, er, towards areas of more secular growth like optical communications or new markets like auto, uh, like auto glass. Um, and as a final note, we just want to thank all the people who helped, who you know, gave their time to speak with, speak with us along the way, including all the folks at Corning, um, investors, the automotive, optical, and other industry experts that we spoke with. Um, we'd be happy to take your questions. I guess I'll start off. Um, I saw you had a 17 times consolidated multiple. How did you think about sort of a sum of the parts analysis? Because I think each business has a pretty different outlook and different risks. You want to take that first? <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's a it's a couple things. So if you look at our, can you hold the top sheet? Yeah. So <clears throat> if you look at some of the parts, this company is actually trading well. One, we're currently trading incredibly cheap, but if you actually follow this company's historical ROIC growth and where it's uh, tracked, that multiple is tracked when they hit what we expect their ROIC to earn into, 17 to 17 to 19 times is actually a very very fair ROIC. And also, if you look at their comps, you know, currently and where they're trading. Coming on a, on a weighted average basis, if you do the sum of the parts, you can actually come into easily um, you know, near that multiple. And by the way, the market actually thinks this thing is currently trading above 16 times, and they're missing you know, the fact that they're valuing cash, which is obviously not generating cash. I, I, the only thing I'd add to that is that we kind of strongly argue that this is a company that should not be thought of as a sum of the parts. And this is a company where every innovation in one segment years later benefits innovation in a completely new market that drives the stock much higher. Um, so if you were to break this thing, in the specific reason, if you were to break this thing up, you would destroy massive amounts of value. So you have to look at it as a, con as a consolidated entity. Just a, a quick question. How much automotive revenue do they have today? And, and you think it could be what? Like what, what's the from to again from a... From, 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 from auto, auto. Okay. So they have very, I mean, I, I think it's a little over a million in optical revenue today. In auto, auto. auto. No, in, yeah, sorry, in auto revenue today. Um, they're in the, so they're announced in six cars. They, they're in six cars. They can only publicly say, um, like, that they're in the uh, i8 and, and the Ford GT, but they like also announced like they're in six cars, they just can't name what those other six cars are. And by the way, the analysts that we spoke to, most of them when we brought this topic up, they're like, oh yeah, they're in two cars right now. And we were stunned by that, that people actually weren't even paying attention or weren't aware of what those other four are. We have our suspicions about what those other four are based on some uh, bar that we've done ourselves. Um, and so, you know, can I, should I say? Tesla, yeah, yeah we think, we're we think pretty they're, sure. That we're pretty confident Tesla. they're actually in the Tesla X and S. Okay, and the, the revenue base of the whole company is what again? It's, uh, how, how much revenue does Corning have in general? So they have you know, almost $10 billion in revenue currently. And you think they can have like $10 billion in auto revenue if they got 100% so penetration the theoretically? Yes, yeah, so the company is actually out there publicly stating um, that they can you know, hit a much bigger number than what we're estimating, but this is potentially a 10 billion square foot market. It's the second largest yeah. glass opportunity in the world after architecture. Is in auto glass. And who 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 are who are like the big auto glass guys that are so, incumbents? Like? So Guardian Glass sells largely into GM. Um, Nippon Sheet Glass uh, sells to. I mean, they're one of the largest ones. They sell to a bunch of different people. Um, and these are the kind of like the people that we talk to. And so like one day I like sat at my desk and called up probably 15 of these guys, and right. they were a little. Un they did not like talking about Corning Gorilla Glass, but all of them knew what it was. And another interesting uh, thing to, to note here, actually another one is uh, Saint Gobain or Sam Goban, if you must. Uh, so they uh, they actually recently did a JV with them. Uh, we don't know the exact size. We have a guess around. So at first they formed a JV with Saint Gobain to kind of share R and D, 
And then about a year later, which was about, uh, I guess, five months ago, they funded the JV. So Saint-Gobain basically supplies one side of the safety glass, and Corning Gorilla Glass supplies the inside sheet of the, Gorilla Gla of the um, auto glass. And um, you know, essentially, one way that we thought about it is this Saint-Gobain is a company that's been around for centuries. Right? They supplied the, the mirrors in uh, Versailles when it was first built. Um, this is a company that knows new things that are coming because they've seen this happen over and over for centuries, and it's just kind of baked into their DNA. And so when both Corning feels confident enough that they're going to realize you know, this market opportunity and Saint-Gobain you know, says like, oh, oh my gosh, like we should partner with, we should you know, get a toehold into this because this market's about to change. So, and that's actually another piece that makes us feel pretty confident about this um, autoglass thesis is these guys understand that there needs to be, you know, there's innovation coming at some point given that it's been 65 years. Mm -hmm. And this is actually going to be a partnership for a lot of them. So they want to get on the train because, again, as he mentioned, it's two fused pieces of glass. If they do ever get similar to uh, other products, they do get to the point where it's just a single pane of gas. Our glass, our weight reduction can be even greater which as you guys, you know, I'm sure you guys know, for auto companies is a huge, huge, very important point you know, for fuel efficiency standards, economy, as well as for, you know, for consumers in general. Whatever Donald Trump says. <laughs> and um, how much more expensive is Gorilla Glass than uh, current uh, products? And then are there any competitors that have a similar new technology for auto? <laughs> so, so first of all, to answer your first question, it's roughly 50% more expensive. Now, historically, Corning has aggressively driven down the cost of its manufacturing, kind of like what you see in display. They aggressively drive down the cost of their manufacturing and can drive down um, the price that they offer um, their competitors. Right now, it's at a 50% premium. It's probably going to stay a premium product for a while, but as they scale into this market, that, that price disparity should come down. Um, so one thing I want to add to that, so this company, this is another thing that was fascinating about this company. By the way, when we first chose it, I thought this was just going to be a boring glass company. And it's actually one of the most fascinating companies I've ever looked at. And another thing that I really, you know, stunned me about this company is they almost, to, to, you know, the day that they come out with a revolutionary product is the day they start working on cost reduction. This company does not rest on its laurels. And they've done that in basically all their end markets. Mm -hmm. But is it really worth it? Because it's 300 bucks per car per your deck. And if it's twice as expensive, if I look at this stuff, I have a Tesla, I have a regular car, I haven't noticed the difference in the glass, I have to tell you. And the consumer doesn't notice the difference in the strength. So if you're in a brutally competitive market like buying cars, adding 150 bucks to your cost as an OEM, all of which is coming out of margin unless the consumer actually sees it, seems not as compelling a proposition as you suggest. So actually a couple things. So we actually spoke to a couple, so we spoke to a lot of auto glass. So I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So I had the good fortune of going to a lot of <laughs> people that work in the auto companies. Um, and we actually spoke to quite a few of them, and OEM suppliers, and market engineers, et cetera. And what was fascinating was, as soon as I said the words weight reduction, they're like, oh, that's something that these guys will pay for. It's incredibly top of mind and incredibly important. And we got you know, ranges for what, people, what they're willing to pay on you know, anywhere from $1 to $3 per you know, pound saved. And that was, like, every single one of them said, okay, this is a top of mind thing because they're like, okay, performance is great, all that. So it actually has performance benefits as mm -hmm. well. By the way, we're not even talking about those. So it actually reduces the center of gravity. The, it, the, and that's kind of why we think that basically this penetration is going to start with the ultra high-end cars, right, as we've already seen, the I-8s, the GTs, where lowering the center of gravity, um, you know, makes basically the value proposition that much more compelling. Just a, a financial question. Over the last decade or so, eyeballing it from your financials, it looks like CapEx has outstripped DNA by cumulatively something like $6 billion. How do you think about free cash flow as it relates to net income going forward, and why would that be different from historical results? Yeah, so, I mean, th this kind of gets into, you know, one of our issues with, um, you know, the, the sum is, uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. They continually reinvest in their markets, and this kind of drives their um, competitive advantages. Now, CapEx being larger than um, DNA, I mean, I, I don't have as much of a problem with that given that they're, comp they're consistently able to get into new markets 
um, and realizing you know, you know, massive potential in you know areas that are untapped by the kind of technology that they can. Uh, I, but apply to I them. guess if if after a decade of that sort of investment, they've got a six percent return on invested capital, uh, it uh, superficially doesn't sound like that investing over a long period of time has actually yielded meaningful results financially as opposed to technology-wise. You know, that's fair. I, I guess I would take issue with one thing. I don't see them, and I know that they don't see themselves as earning a 6% return on invested capital right now. If you were to take out the cash, which they're actively returning, and then take out the DTA, which they're actively earning into, it's really more of an 85 9% ROIC. And this is the kind of return that you historically see from this company as they're starting to transition into new markets. I mean, this is a product cycle company, and when they hit a major product cycle like LCD um, display glass substrates or you know, long-haul optical fiber in the 90s or you know, CRT tubes or you know, I can go down the list, you see a sustained jump in ROIC as they basically monetize all this R&D that they've been spending over the years. So essentially you have two choices. You can either do what they're doing right now and realize massive market opportunities when they hit and basically make a lot of money when those hit. Or you can kind of not invest in your businesses and resign yourself to be a more commoditized player in these markets. I kind of prefer this. Um, is their technology compatible with other new glass technologies? Like there's this tiny little company on Long Island that makes uh, sunroofs that are in like six high-end cars and you flip a switch and it Oh, the photoelectronic, yeah. Yeah, so, and they say the that they're gonna conquer yeah. the world. Yeah, it's, uh, the symbol is re reefer. Yeah. Research Frontiers, I think. I, I'm not sure of a company called Reefer, but, uh, <laughs> but, but no, they, so, <laughs> that's a different business. Um, yeah, I, so they're able to, they're completely able to do that. Um, I mean, so, I mean, they, they, there are videos all over their website of them being able to basically, you know, in architectural glass, uh, this isn't stuff that's on the market, but they're completely able to, you know, make things where, you know, basically, stroke your finger down the side of it and it, you know, goes dark. Or, you know, in, and that's the kind of stuff that they're able to bring to the table in autos But is it eventually. compatible with their technology or is it instead of? Like, 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 do they represent a threat to your thesis? No. No, so. No. So if, if I'm understanding your question. <laughs> no threat to the thesis. Yeah. Okay. Just one last quick question. Sure. So, uh, just really uh, kind of extending Craig's question. Think of a business where for the life of the business, or at least the, the recent known life of the business, that their capex is, they're always outspending their net income uh, and they're developing great technologies. Um, you're valuing the company, I mean, most of the uh, valuation seems focused on what the right PE multiple is for the business. Is a PE multiple or an ROIC multiple, uh, you know, measure of the business the right measure if, you know, in fact, net income you know, materially overstates how much cash the business uh, generates because of you know, a very high degree of uh, capex spending. I mean, how how do you think about valuing a company uh, like this? What's the right way to, to value it? Yeah, so I mean, this is something that we kind of thought about for a while. You know, should we value this on a free cash flow yield or a price of free cash flow, or should or should we use an earnings multiple um, for exactly the reason you're talking about? And I think at this moment, right now, based on the kind of market opportunity that we're seeing, especially in optical. And the fact that they've increased investing um, to because the optical um, the optical fiber market is you know kind of at, at max capacity utilization, um, and part of the you know deal with Verizon that was announced yesterday was you know they're basically building out some um, more fiber capacity to be able to supply this market. Um, we really feel like you know earnings right now is the right way to value this because they're investing for growth that is going to be realized in you know not in 15, 20 years, but in three years and two years. Um, so, th you know, we, we did think about that, and, and that's kind of why we, we decided to go with an earnings. Okay, so we're out, of, we're out of time, but thanks very much. All right, thank, thank you.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Gustavo. This is Tiago. This is Roberto. We're excited to here to pitch to you Dollarama. I stock with 92% uptight potential and a 14% IRR over the next five years. Uh, we see is that a very compelling investment opportunity with a symmetric return profile of five times the reward to risk. Um, Dollarama is a high growth Canadian discount chain uh, with 1,100 stores and three billion Canadian dollars in revenues. That has compounded the earnings uh, per share by 32% over the last 10 years. Our thesis has four main points. Uh, first is that the market misunderstands Dollarama's business modeling, model labeling it as another dollar store. It has a 15% at margin versus five to 7% of comparables. It has an extremely efficient operation uh, that combines the margins along the chain. It cuts the middleman to deliver very good value to its customers, with price points ranging from $125 to $4 instead of just a single dollar price point. Oh, sorry. Two, uh, we see a very long growth runway. Uh, we have a variant view on this total addressable market of 3,000 stores, while the market sees 1,700, that is the management guidance, that they up every two years. So. Um, compared to U.S. levels, Canada has half the penetration per capita of dollar stores. Three, high barriers to entry. Um, Dollarama has a scale that allows it to spread costs along, among the stores, while the peers do not have such scale. It, um, it is a key source of competitive advantage for them that allows them to have a 38% uh, IRR in their new stores. We see it's a very good inside protection um, because such a high return business as Dollarama, it's not surprising that they have been able to grow while uh, generating a lot of free cash flow that they have been delivering back to shareholders via buybacks and we, can, we believe that you will continue to do so. DPS, uh, the key drivers for our case um, in the EPS are same store sales growth um, due to tailwinds from its legacy stores and uh, the new stores opening coupled with buybacks. We have a base case with a 19 times forward multiple, uh, down from 26 times now, um, that we feel like it's very consistent with what the company has been delivering. It, it, will, be, it will amount a 20% CAGR in EPS in the next five years. So going to thesis one, the business model. Dollarama has efficiency in every inch of the store. It has taller shelves, boxes on top of it, frequent replenishment, convenient locations, and store format. This is key for them to uh, deliver margins that, if you compare to American dollar stores that have $15 a bit per square foot, Dollarama has 56. And the product mix is very important. It ranges from 125 to $4. This flexibility allows them to keep sales or same source sales growth by introducing higher priced products every two years. And um, they have uh, an ability to pass inflation that other dollar stores not have. Uh, we have brought some of the products here so that you can see that Dollarama delivers better products for similar prices than other dollar stores. And compared to big boss retailers, they delivered good enough for far less. Now, Gilberto will continue. So, this, this is true. Marx underestimate Dollarama's growth runway. Canada has half dollar store per capita compared to the US. Marx thinks that this difference cannot be closed entirely because Canada has a lower population density. But let, let's do a quick exercise. Suppose these two marks have the same population and you wanted to open five stores. Besides the, the, the same density, you could capture much more customer in the left example. Canada, lower density is due to its huge unpopulated area with people concentrating in few small regions. Uh, the US, on the other hand, is much more of a small town country. 52% of the population live in cities larger than 20,000 people. Whereas in Canada, this number is 67%. Given the Canadian distrib population distribution, you need logistics and scale to cross the distance among the, the urban agglomerations, but you can operate even more dollar stores per capita. 
We believe management can reach 1,700 stores in five years. This number, this level would still represent only 70% of the US penetration. We are also confident on a 5% same store sales growth. Historically, management has been delivering from 4 to 7%, and we believe they will continue to do so by improving product mix. This is three, high barriers to entry. For those trying to open dollar stores in Canada, they will compete with Dollarama, a chain that is an, an 800 pound gorilla with 1,100 stores with 98% of brand recognition. It has great prices by sourcing 53% of its merchandise directly from low cost international manufacturers mostly from China. And it's upstream integrated, combining margins along the chain, and with the flexibility to, to replace product offerings 30% every year to, cap, to attract traffic. Even for our American chain, these bar barriers will still be high, one, because one must. First, we label all its products to include French. Second, adapt its assortment to please the well-educated but relatively low-income Canadian consumer. Even Walmart is a little bit, bit fancier in, in Canada. Three, find convenient real estate locations as Dollarama has. And last, establish cross-border logistics. For instance, Dollar Tree it still uses a third part distribution center, leaving margins on the table. So expanding to Canada would co take a long time and will burn a lot of cash. Let's remember how Target failed miserably trying to accelerate its, its expansion to Canada. Now, Tiago will continue. This is number four. Dollarama has a meaningful downside protection that comes from a strong new stores unit economics. Low investment and fast ramp up gives payback in three years. And we will see a long runway to further increase store count while keeping the same profitability. In addition to new stores unit economics, Dollarama has an efficient capital allocation. It can use its excess cash flow generation to repurchase stocks as evidenced by a 22% reduction in the number of shares of changing the neck in the past five years. Behind all this, there's a very strong management team that create a lot of value. Insiders combining on 10% of Dollarama, being well incentivized and with skin in the game. Wrapping up, we believe that there is an asymmetric risk reward profile of five times. In the base case scenario, we see a 92% upside and a 14% IR over the next five years. Here we are considering 1,700 stores. It's almost half of the total addressable market that we presented before. So we we'll still have run to have growth in the future. Despite that, we are decreasing uh, or compressing our multiple or forward PE from 26 times to 19 times in our base case scenario. In our bear case, we see a 30% downside, assuming constant number of stores, a same store sales of only 2%, and a forward PE compression to 16 times. All just said, risks. Biggest one, competition. Dollarama has a low product overlap with big box retailers. About e-commerce, Dollarama has an average ticket of sale of $13. When we look at Amazon in Canada, for example, they have a minimum order of $35 to have a free delivery. Lastly, we made a field trip to Canada to make sure that we have a deep understanding of the business. We visited 15 stores and from Dollarama and competitors and talked to industry experts and to customers. Thank you so much for your time and we are happy to answer your questions.
you talk a little bit more about the threat of Amazon? So you mentioned that uh, the low um, unit price makes it difficult for them to compete, but they're also paying for real estate that Amazon's not paying for. So just a little bit more thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah you can talk. Uh, for example, uh, the first thing is Dollarama has very low price points. Even they having like a different price points is still up to four dollars. So it's really hard for Amazon in Canada uh, in the near future to deliver just very low ticket products. As I mentioned, they have a thirty-five minimum order right now in Canada. And does when Amazon you... Prime exist in Canada? Sorry. Does Amazon Prime exist in Canada? Uh, yeah, we yeah. Amazon Prime is twenty-five minimum orders. Minimum orders, yeah, uh, like uh, add-on items. It is cost like eighty eighty dollars per year. And, and even when you look at Amazon, the same product here, it's uh, the product that costs two dollars at Dollarama costs seven point ninety five at Amazon because they don't have direct sourcing as Dollarama, so they sell third party products and they don't have the same price. Uh, how many products did you compare for price? Or is it? These yeah. three, or how many like SKUs did you go through? Uh, sure, we, we did a comparison of close to 30 products. We have pictures of many of them. Because um, th one difficult thing is that really the overlap of products is really low with Dollarama and other, uh, other, other stores because they are almost some designer of products. They mm -hmm. go to the manufacturer di directly and I say, I want a product with this, I want a glass with white dots. And they uh, ordered that thing. So, uh, and if you go to uh, the more, uh, like say, commodity products like consumables, they have a very good price if you compare. We, even uh, an anecdotal fact, the cashier from Walmart that we talked, he, she told us like, oh, I buy my shampoos at Dollarama. So <laughs> it, they have a very, very, uh, we compare like many, many products. And, and, so. and, and they are like increasing the number of white labels. So should, it was like 20% of the SKUs in the past like one year, yeah. and this year is going to reach like 25. So they are aware of the threat, and they have been investing like uh, to build their own brand for the future. Really, the same question for the pre from the previous panel. Um, they sort of outspend their DNA about two times in terms of capex versus DNA, making the you know free cash flow yield here is much lower than a, the kind of the earnings yield of the company. And obviously, it's a growth business. How do you think about that? You know, again, a lot of focus on PE as a valuation metric. How have you valued the business? And uh, what's the right way to think about a business like this? I'm on page 42. I'm just looking at your yeah. free cash flow calculation. Sure. Can you can you just rephrase the question? I didn't. I'm sorry. I think I didn't. I didn't get it. So sorry. if you go, if you go, so take a look at. Um, okay. You know your little chart on page 42, depreciation and amortization. Mm -hmm. uh, starting in 2013, 48 million capex, 96 million. You know, if you carry that forward, they're sort of consistently outspending their depreciation. So the, you know the, if you look at the business just on a PE basis, uh, and you compare it to other businesses on a PE basis, you know how. Uh, you know, how much of the earnings, I mean, again, I think of the value of a business as the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life, and that earnings are kind of an imprecise calculation of, you know, just, you, you know, picking a P multiple, I think is not the, not the right way to think about it. I mean, just maybe you can help us with how you thought about valuing the business. What, what's your methodology for figuring out what this company is worth in three years or five years? Mm -hmm. uh, if you look here, like, uh we are using 8% uh, cost of equity, so in five years it's going to be like a 50% compounder uh, plus 20%. So comparing the GCF to, to the P multiple that we did, I believe they're pretty much in line. And I don't know. I think, I think the, 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 the main idea that we had here is uh, we look at the, how, how they are earning today and how they are growing. And so we look at it in five years. We still believe that in, it's still in five years, there will still be a lot of room for growth. Yeah. So that's, that's, we think that the multiple compression, compression that we are using is, is, still, uh, is still conservative. So uh, we use the DCF more to, to, to validate. But uh, we, we, 
the main thing, the main valuation that we did was based on the, the earnings that we projected for the next for the, the, the five years. And uh, given that we believe that there there was a lot of room for growth, and we compressed to the, the multiple to 16, mm -hmm. so we still believe it's a it's conservative. It was yeah. conservative. And one extra thing about cash flows, if you get last year's the cash flow distribution was like the company made 500 million out of operations, had 150 million capex, and took that of 500 million. If you get the last last years. So by this, they repurchased stock like 850 million on over a 10 billion market cap. So the company generates a lot of cash in a very light basis. They rent, they have leases from the stores to some of the uh, materials and also uh, their distribution centers. So they are very asset light. So that's why uh, in the DCF you see like a depreciation goal was up very low. So, so obviously a great business. I guess the concern I have is, you know, valuation and sustainability. How do you get comfortable, just it goes through to Bill's question a little bit, you know, capitalizing 24% EBITDA multiple, EBITDA margins at a 17 times multiple in a company that sells physical product that only has a few billion dollars of revenue, not like it has that tremendous scale. So what are the things you looked at that said, this is sustainable, I'm willing to capitalize this? I have one other question. What price did Bain come in at, and what price did they come out at in terms of multiple? Uh, um, so, like, about, about multiples, um, you forget it because we're right. Uh, the company has been trading at high multiples for a long time. Uh, this is consistent with their, their growth profile and profitability, having, like, very low capital consumption to grow in the stock buybacks. Uh, if you get to the, our, our base case here, uh, and even in the bull case, you see it has a uh, free cash flow yield of 11% uh, in our bull case. So we think that like 11% is a very good free cash flow yield for, uh, to pay like a 21 multiple in the exit. So we are being very conservative uh, in the exit multiples to account for, to have a margin of safety on this. Uh, possible issues in big case. So well, one, one question I have. So if, if you look at competition and like, yeah, I, I said Dollar Tree has like deals or something like that, I think it used to be called in Canada. What, are those guys growing stores quickly? Or are they comping up? I mean, it's like, obviously like, this thing has the highest margins of any retailer in the world, basically. I mean, maybe, maybe there's, I don't know, something else out there. Um, but it's, it's margin structure is truly extraordinarily. So, so, so the obvious, whether it's Amazon or yeah, these guys, buy stores at three times EBIT, but they trade at, you know, 20 times EBIT or something like that. So if I was Dollar Tree, I'd be trying to build a bunch of stores at eight times EBIT to compete with them at, you know, their three times EBIT stores, you know. Uh, well, well, what's actually happening there? I mean, is there substantial unit growth in Canada by other uh, dollar store guys? Um, let me just, just one second to put this slide here. Forty-six. Yeah, here, uh, here we can see where, like, how do they gather margins different from their competitors? So, if you take a look at Dollar Tree and Dollar General, you see the huge difference in cogs. This is due to their direct sourcing. They really import. They are much as an importer as they are a retailer. So they are very different from the other dollar stores. And why Dollar Tree cannot do the same thing? They had a plan like three years ago to expand to 1,000 stores in Canada. They only delivered 200. And they have been at 200 for like two or three years. And this is because they are fixed, one, they are fixed in a 125 price point. They can't go uh, past inflation as Dollarama can. They, their price ranges from 125 to $4. So Whenever there is any changes, they can up their prices a little bit. Uh, and even if you get SGNA, Dollar is much more efficient than uh, than Dollar Tree. And Dollar General, if you see, uh, it seems that SGNA is lower in a, a percentage of sales, but Dollar General sells like 70% of consumables. That's why they dilute uh, SGNA in like things without with low margin. So 
we, we just don't see competition being as effective as them to grow uh, and take their market, their margins away, so. What most will your bank coming out of? Sorry? What most will your bank be coming out of? Oh, bank, it was, it was 12, uh, 10, 12 times a P in the IPO. So they must be very sorry to us. So we, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Is it on? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's on. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Nick Bryde, and these are my teammates, Antonio and V. And we are pitching a short on Schmuckers. Uh, our price target is $85 to $90 per share, which represents 30 to 35% upside. SJM is a $15 billion market cap company operating in the consumer staple space. Our price target of 87 bucks represents nine and a half times forward EBITDA. The bulls on the stock believe in continued cost rationalization, a return to top line growth, margin expansion, and they hold out, ho they hold out hope for a craft takeout. We believe, however, the stock has rallies run out of steam, and there's only downside from here. Our short thesis is predicated upon the following components. First, Schmucker's three core business segments are all experiencing various levels of deterioration with its largest profit pool of coffee undergoing secular decline. Second, Schmucker's key customer retailers, including Walmart, are feeling squeezed between increased competition from Amazon on one side and discount and private label chains such as Aldi on the other. In turn, they are passing on that squeeze to their key suppliers, such as Schmucker's, in the form of double-digit cost reductions. Third, management's capital allocation track record leaves much to be desired. In particular, management has developed a unique ability of deploying capital into projects that don't earn their cost of capital. Fourth and finally, the craft premium is at play here, with Schmucker's trading well above historical trading multiples. And we view, but we view a craft takeout as very low given minimal overlap with craft's acquisition criteria. So, in short, the bulls on the street and the lazy longs in the cap table have overlooked the inherent weakness in this security while holding out hope for a turnaround or a takeout. We believe neither are likely and recommend a short. Quickly on the business itself, Schmuckers operates in three core business segments, coffee retail, consumer foods, and pet foods, all roughly equal size. And as you'll see on the screen behind me, many are household brand names, but in which, in our view, have seen better days. Now, the first business segment that we like to touch on is the coffee business. Uh, this business represents 40% of total profit of Smucker, uh, and this business has strong in the last four years that the com company mainly served in the traditional roast and grow coffee segment, which is in the for a secular decline. The only area of major growth in the coffee business in the state now is the single serve, um, and Smucker has tried to re-enter into this market with a big launch of the Duncan K-Cup in 2015, and they had a nice uh, sales bump in the first year. Uh, but we learned through our primary research that there was some element of general stuffing involved. Uh, and so sales in the most recent months have tumbled pretty dramatically, as you can see on the bottom right chart. Uh, we'd like to also make two other observations uh, on the single serve market. First, this is a category with no barrier to entry, where private label has gained market share very rapidly. And second, most of the economics of this business is actually retained by the licensor rather than smoker. Next, on a business, in a business where uh, Smucker essentially buy commodity and sell brands, their coffee brands have lost much of their pricing power. And this is evident in just how violently coffee volume has reacted to just a slight increase in price, as you can see from the chart here. And when competition has deteriorated from one that focuses on branding and, comp and, um, and innovation to one that focuses on price, 
uh, there will be margin pressure. And indeed, if we strip out the commodity tailwind that the company enjoyed in the last three years, the operating margin of their coffee business has come down by about five to 600 basis points. And in response to this, management has stepped on advertising for their mainstream uh, ONG brand. We learned through our primary research, however, that they are fighting an uphill battle uh, in this secularly declining uh, traditional ONG market. Um, and putting more money behind the mainstream brand is not going to help them. Our next point is on the pet food business, which represents 25% of total profits. SJM got into the space back in 2015 when they acquired Big Heart for $5.8 billion, or a 13x multiple. The problem is that they paid a premium multiple for a business that is in decline. The first point I wanted to highlight is that SJM clearly misjudged the potential of this business. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the stark difference between what they guided to versus what they actually achieved. More importantly, however, is that they said that the Big Heart CEO was going to remain in the company, yet he left after only one year and was replaced by an SJM lifer with no prior pet food experience. Now, quickly on the market, Big Heart's market share has been declining the past five years, and here on the bottom right, we have the most recent sales data, and sales are down in all categories. More importantly, they're down in pet, in pet snacks, which was the only bright spot in Big Heart's portfolio. Now, as we just mentioned, this business is in decline. Up on the screen, we have the core EBITDA of the business, which we obtained by stripping out the effect of synergies. Now, core EBITDA has been declining by 5.7% per year since being acquired by SJM. This has prompted management to say that they're going to reset the pet business strategy going forward. However, our primary research indicates this new strategy is unlikely to succeed, so we expect to see continued weakness. Moving on to the consumer food segment, which also represents 25% operating profit. Um, this has traditionally been the crown jewel of SJM. However, as you can see from all the red on the screen behind me, it hasn't been doing so great recently. And it's not only that sales are down, but market share is also down across the board. Now, the core portfolio of the consumer business which you obtained by st stripping out the only hit product that they've had recently, has been declining at a 3.3% clip during the past four years and appears to be in secular decline. So to briefly recap, coffee is down, pet is down, and consumer is also down. Now, our second thesis point is that the pressure from retailers will likely intensify. And this will affect not only prices, but also volumes. In terms of prices, Reuters reported that Walmart met with its top suppliers and demanded that they cut prices by 15%. Now this price decline would go straight to the bottom line and crush SJM's earnings. In terms of volume, Walmart said it was going to increase the presence of its private label. More shelf space for private label will translate to less shelf space for CPG companies. Now, Smokers is particularly vulnerable to this threat because 30% of its revenues are tied down to Walmart. Now, our third thesis point is on management. In evaluating management, we're looking for three things. First, uh, their ability. Second, their incentives. And third, whether they are candid in reporting to the owner of the business. And smoker management have failed in all these three tests. On their ability, the yardstick that we use to evaluate their ability is return on invested capital. And if we can just take a look at the chart on the left-hand side here, I'd like to just make two observations. First, the ROI of the underlying businesses have come down in the last six years, and that is to us an indication of support operating ability on the part of management. Secondly, there's a large gap between the ROI of the underlying businesses and the overall ROI of the business, which takes into account goodwill in the calculation, and this large gap in indication of poor capital allocation. And this is not surprising when we take a look at the track record of this acquisitive company. In the past 10 years, they've done 12 transactions, and many of these transactions seem to us to be motivated by management desire to boost short-term top line and bottom line rather than create enduring long-term shareholder value. And some of these transactions as highlighted on the screen have proven to be unsound and subsequently divested. And within part of the problem in the way that the incentive system is actually set up, which we believe to perversely focus management on short term and also based on um, solely on adjusted EPS, which we believe to be a flaw yardstick in the absence of return on invested capital. Um, 
And third is on management reporting. Uh, smoker management reporting is anything but candid. Uh, we put up two charts here on the screen for you, and you can see from that, the moment a business fundamentals start deteriorating, um, earning quality deteriorating, deteriorate as quickly, and management start to move the goal post in order to look better. And finally, on the, the last pillar of our thesis valuation, as you can see from the chart behind me, uh, SJM is trading at a healthy premium to their historical 10-year average multiple. Again, we believe this is a function of one, the 3G craft effect, which has really inflated multiples throughout the consumer staple industry. And then second, it's more about a return to growth, a return to margin expansion, which we believe is unlikely. In terms of valuation, quickly, we use a DCF primarily based upon a bottoms-up model, and we triangulate it based upon using other valuation methodologies to come up with our $87 base case target price. In terms of key risks, I'll just hit on a few. One, clearly the Kraft Heinz takeout is top of mind. Additionally, you know, potential new cost savings, international expansion, or turnaround of the pet business could all be headwinds to our thesis. In terms of catalysts, we, we have many on this page, but we only believe one to two are necessary to really move uh, the security towards our target price. A few I'll hit on. First, Kraft announcing its true takeout target, which would derate the rest of the company's multiples. Two, clearly pricing pressure from big box retailers such as Walmart, coffee commodity price inflation, which is their biggest cost input within their largest profit pool segment, as well as a potentially lowering of guidance at a subsequent earnings announcement. So in sum, 85 to $90 target price, 30 to 35% upside, and an upside case, downside case ratio of three to one. Thank you. Do you have a, a slide with the short interest ratio, and has that changed over time? Because I guess my concern is that, is this story priced into the stock? Yeah, so on the top right there, it's 3.8% short interest. So it was a little bit higher about a month ago, but the, the stock's fallen about 10% since, and it's come down slightly, but it's relatively low. So before I came, I spoke to our sell side analyst, and I said, you know, uh, is there a short thesis with Smuckers? And she basically ticked off every single one of your points. So I guess my concern, it, 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 does the street, the street knows about this? Like, like, so where is the variant perception? Like, like what isn't, why isn't this price into the stock particularly? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the variant perception here is, I think everyone recognizes the weakness within this industry in general, and I think within Schmucker in particular, but when you look at consensus, they're basically projecting a mini hockey stick of, okay, it's negative growth this year, but it's going to come back to 1% to 2% positive top line growth and margin expansion. And that's really what the street and consensus is baking into their estimates. And we, you know, our forecast more or less is just forecasting a continued deterioration in the business, which we believe more accurate, accurately reflects, you know, the future performance. How much opportunity do you think, let's say Kraft Times were to buy the business, obviously they are pretty good at running businesses more efficiently. Take us through uh, what you think the cost opportunity would be for Kraft Heinz to acquire the, uh, the business. Yeah, um, look, I think first, uh, the margins with, for SJM are above industry average, so it's like a 23% EBITDA margin business. I think Kraft's around 30%. The peers in general, it's probably more around 18 and 19 percent. So I think there, clearly, there's, if, you know, 3G Kraft bought them, there would be room for them to expand margins. But I would highlight this page behind me, which, you know, we tried to outline here what we believe to be Kraft's acquisition criteria and why we don't think SJM fits it. So first, you know, SJM is a U.S. business, 94 percent of sales. Um, it's a negative growth business, which we think Kraft is looking for growth, um, they're looking for international. Um, the operational proven potential certainly is there, but I don't think it's as meaningful as with other businesses. And then finally, the last thing I would highlight is the unique voting structure of SJM's voting shares, where insiders, if you've held it for more than four years, you get 10 votes per share. And the Schmucker family, you know, fifth generation CEO, has run this business since 1898, I believe. Um, they don't want to sell this business, that's our view. And we think, you know, with their voting rights, while they own about 5% of the company today, 10 votes per share, um, 
they have a substantial block which could inhibit a takeout. Hi, uh, so two questions for me. One, um, do you really think that uh, there's a KHC premium priced into this stock given one, antitrust issues in coffee, which are 40% of profits? So it sort of nullifies any deal if you have to sell that. And <clears throat> two, the family ownership, which you correctly pointed out. And then second part of the question, why this company and not General Mills or Kellogg or Campbell's, who arguably have worse fundamentals in some of their categories? Uh, take that on the first part. So the first question, regarding the, if the multiple is priced in, when the Unilever acquisition was announced, the stock traded, well, traded down Friday, and then when it, when it was canceled, it traded up 4%. So we feel there's some type of premium baked in. It's hard to know exactly how many terms, but it is reacting to changes. The second one, you want to take this? Um. Yeah, and also I would just highlight this chart. This is of the overall sector uh, trading multiples. and. What we tried to do, and we're not saying that the entire multiple expansion within SJM or within the sector is driven by craft only, but we certainly think there's certainly a case to be made that part of it is. I think you could also argue there's like a bond proxy trade that investors have done the last few years with the dividend yield. But um, I think you know, when you look at the cap table, it's a bunch of ETFs. There's no active investors. You know, we think it just trades in line with the sector, and the sector is traded up as kind of the rumors have. Uh, been around. And that's sort of like tie back to the point that uh, Paul made. You basically asked your analysts and they check all these points and clearly your smart money, if you look at the, um, the, the shareholder list, there is there obviously no smart money in here. There's just a bunch of ETF. <laughs> <laughs> and then th why not uh, General Mills, Kellogg, or Campbell's? Um, I, I, I yeah, I mean, I think I would say, I think... <laughs> no, no, I, I think the one thing that we found unique about it was the coffee, because um, I think mainstream roasting, roasting ground, these guys, are 40% of their profits are in this segment of the market that is basically declining at 1% to 2% per year. They're losing share within that segment, and we just felt like that was a compelling base to start, and then we kind of dug into it from there and found the other uh, catalyst, potentially. Thank you. What? Why now? What, 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 what is your timing to play out in the short? So I think we were kind of fortunate in a sense, but we started looking at the company to, because of what Nick just alluded to. And then we started in February. And then suddenly Walmart announced this new pricing program, which helped our case. And that's why eventually we decided to pitch it here, but I'll just walk you through. So Walmart announced that Barron's ha also had a piece on this. Three analysts, sell side analysts, the, uh, downgraded it to a sell rating as well. So I think they may have gotten a first draft of this presentation. <laughs> but, um, but the why now is we see weakness that, again, weakness in the past that we believe is going to continue in the future. And with the Walmart change, that, that gave us our catalyst, essentially. And it's unclear when they will ro roll out the national plan. But when they do, that's when we think this will trade down. But speaking of a catalyst and the fact that you know most of the investors are there probably for the dividend, how bad does it have to get for them to cut the dividend? And that, I believe that would be the last thing they would do. They have $800 million in unlevered, unlevered the cash flow and they're paying a $350 million dividend. It would have to get pretty bad. I don't think they would do that in the short term. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Isabella Lin, and I have my teammate Angie and Windsor here tonight. We're pitching Yum China tonight. We recommend a buy with a two-year price upside of 
and a bull case upside of 61%, representing a 3 to 1 up-down ratio. Yum China is the dominant player in the 150 billion Chinese QSR market. It spun off from Yum, Yum Brands in October 2016, and since then trades at the New York Stock Exchange. We think the market is overly concerned with the volatile performance in the past four years and underestimates the recovery potential for the company. We believe the company can deliver sustainable calm growth in the, in the future above um, market estimates. And we think buying a category killer with attractive cash flow fundamentals and impressive growth profile at eight times EBITDA is quite attractive. Quick introduction on Yum China. Yum China operates KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and two other local brands across 7,700 restaurants in China. And Angie will walk you through um, the unit expansion opportunity for the company. Thanks, Isabella. Our first thesis emphasizes the ample growth runway. China's restaurant industry is highly fragmented. As you can see, chain QSR accounts for only 9% of total market size, significantly smaller than other mature markets. For Western QSR, compared with Taiwan sharing similar traits of food, culture, and geography, the penetration of Western QSR in mainland China is still relatively low. So we believe there are still opportunities exist for chain QSR, especially for young China. Specifically, lower tier cities present even larger opportunities for doubling Yam China's store base. Yam China enjoys clear first mover advantage. It has 18 distribution centers and a well established local business development team in place with better data and local connection. From our calculation, the long term growth opportunities in lower tier cities provide a room of 4,000 to 6,000 new stores for KFC, for example. Another growth area is the increase in traffic transport hubs. The number of high-speed rail stations, airports, metro stations, and transit hubs will grow at a KGO at least 20% for the next three years, translating to 700 to 900 new stores for KFC. For our expert interviews, the national brand status of Yam China allows them to secure critical sites. So all in all, considering all the above factors, we believe the average net unit additions in the next three years are achievable based on what they delivered before. Thank you, Angie. So, as Angie mentioned, we are confident that Yam China has ample growth runway to go. But when we look at the unit economics, we can see that the company not only has an opportunity to grow, but to grow highly accretively. Cash on cash returns for new units in 2016 for KFC and Pizza Hut were 40% and 26% respectively. And we think management's doing a great job of keeping up returns despite tough operating conditions. Speaking of tough operating conditions, in 2013 and 14, successive food scandals hit Yum China, bringing comp sales to decline to as low as negative 20% in some quarters. But as you can see in the chart, the company's high cash flow generation ability allows, allowed it to keep returns above 15% even at the worst of times. Not only that, they were able to completely fund their network growth capex from operating cash flow during those two years. We think that this resilience is being overlooked by the market, and we think it's a testament to the quality of the business and its ability to compound returns into the long term. So we also think that the company's scale will allow it to maintain high rates of return into the future. Our discussions with ex supply chain um, executives in Yum China and McDonald's China suggest that Yum China has a distinct cost advantage in terms of their food and paper costs, which is the highest cost item in, the, in, in Yum China. This leads to higher margins and higher returns, and we think that this will sustain higher, higher returns, especially as the company continues to get larger. Touching on management, we think that the current management in place is best positioned to deliver accretive growth into the future. Post the spin-off, they are more aligned to Yum China's performance rather than Yum, Yum Brands, and looking at their incentive incentives, we think that they're properly incentivized to deliver high rates of return, focusing on profitability and same-store sales growth, and not a network growth at all costs, which we think can be dilutive to returns into the future. And while we're speaking about management, we just wanted to mention that the CEO in the last week, 
purchased $3 million worth of YUM stock after the Q1 results and after the stock went up by 20%. We, we think that this is a very positive sign in terms of the increased confidence that the management has for its long-term growth prospects. I'll now pass you on to Isabella, who will talk about our comp growth opportunities. Thank you, Windsor. We think now is a good time to buy as the company is at its inflection point. We, we project the comp growth will come in faster than market estimates based on three reasons. One, limited risk of future food scandals, and two, strong, loyal customer base, and three, secular tailwinds from delivery and digital initiatives. Touching on the first point, after our conversation with supply chain in, uh, veterans um, who work at other large QSR companies in China, we feel comfortable that Yum China now has the best system and process in place to prevent future food scandals, stricter supplier selection, and more transparency in the sup upstream supply chain management with some of the actions that the company has taken. In addition, the company has dedicated PR team by each city cluster to manage future media outbreak. So all in all, we feel comfortable that the risk of severe shocks from food scandals going forward is limited. So you might wonder, do customers come back to Yum China at all? So we did a primary research with over 700 participants in over, uh, over 10 uh, cities in China, and the results suggest that customers consistently come back to Yum China for its convenience, taste, and safe food. Touching on the third point, delivery and digital are not a driver for growth. Investors may be, uh, may be concerned that the rise of food aggregators similar to SimList in the US may create more competition for the company. However, as you can see from the chart on the left here, data shows that Yum China is actually gaining market share online. They're growing their online presence faster than their peers uh, in the industry. And the potential for them to increase their um, revenue mix from delivery to, to as high as 25% or even higher than that is visible going forward. And as evidenced by the successful Domino's digital story, we think the Pizza Hut recovery can be fueled by a similar strategy. And the Q1 uh, results show evidence supporting our thesis. So in conclusion, we project Yum China to deliver at least 3 to 4% calm growth in the next two to three years, which we think is highly achievable. So just to wrap up, we recommend Long Yum China as it is the leading QSR brand, best position to capitalize on the um, unit expansion opportunity in underpenetrated cities. Also, we think it's a high quality cash cow with attractive unit economics trading at an attractive multiple. We project a 64% EPS upside, primarily, as you can see from the EPS bridge here, from um, sustainable calm growth, modest unit expansion, and clear margin expansion opportunity. We use a 20 times PE multiple over 2019 EPS of $2.23 to get to our, our price target. I would like to mention that Yum China actually has a billion of net cash on balance sheet and has no debt. There is potential to level up the balance sheet. And the balance sheet upside translates to a PEX cash multiple of less than 16 times, which we think is highly attractive. So touching on some of the areas where we could be wrong, obviously any future food scandal or consumer preference shifting towards a healthier alternative would bring pressure to our calm recovery. Also on the margin side, rising rental costs and labor costs in China may cause restaurant margin to deteriorate. And on last point on Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut has been in decline in the past two years. Failure to turn that part of the business around would obviously create pressure to our, not only our top line, but also our unit economics. But we ran a downside case scenario incorporating all these risks and felt comfortable with the 23% downside and still attractive by the, by the three to one up down ratio. So this is the end of our presentation. You know, thank you very much, and we're welcome to. We're happy to take any questions you might have. I have two questions for you guys. Uh, the first is on currency. How do you think about hedging the RMB for a U.S. dollar investor? And the second is, I think some investors are concerned about the VAT tax holiday and how that's inflated earnings. Um, can you give a sense of how much that's lifted earnings and what sort of sustainability that might have? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you for your question. I would take um, the currency question. You know, we thought about that, and you know, um, given the revenue and cost of both R and B denominator uh, denominated, um, the currency effect only appears in the translation. And we think that uh, currency risk can be easily hedged out. And even if you exclude the leakage in between two to five percent, the upside, which is above thirty percent, is still quite attractive in our opinion. Uh, page 53, yeah. Yeah, so just to mention, you know, in Q1, um, due to VAC test, actually Q1 restaurant margin expanded by about 380 basis point. You know, we think, and in our model, uh, that effect obviously would play in, but it would only um, play in 2016 to 2017. So you're right, going forward, um, a lot of the margin expansion would be from operating leverage, um, and also just more efficient in terms of labor and uh, rental costs because you know a, a, a large part of our thesis is on digital and delivery and delivery revenue flows directly to the bottom line. How do you feel about the capital intensity and basically what's gone wrong in the last five years? Um, they've spent about three billion in capex to open 2,000 new restaurants, uh, which is 40 percent more restaurants, and then EBITDA, sorry, revenue at the same time period went up by basically $300 million, which is 60 million of EBITDA. Um, so I know you had a slide there about the uh, high return on invested capital for new stores, but clearly it hadn't been that good for historic new stores that they opened in the last five years. So can you explain why it's different now? Yeah, I, I can take that question. I, I think the, as the sales per store have come down, um, they have been changing the way that they've, they've been opening new stores. So on that slide where we show the, the returns over time, the 2013 store does not look like the 2016 store that they're opening now. The 2016 store accounts for a smaller sales and they've um, maximized the productivity there, which has uh, allowed them to increase the margin, I margin over time. Um, and then the second, your, your question was, you're, you're thinking about whether the old network, the old fleet is as high performing as the... I, I, what I'd like to understand is how the capital the return on capital has changed so dramatically because the numbers are substantial in terms of the total capex they spent and the very very slim revenue increase they got for that and the store mm -hmm. count increase and i know it's better now but it's yeah. apparently dramatically better yeah and the reason for sort of revenue only increasing by 300 million i think a lot of it due, it's due to the food scandals um while they're building new stores um while those stores are pro uh, would, would deliver this return but you know they for example, in uh, 2013, 2014, when they have food scandals hitting them, the same store sale growth declined 12.5%. Um, that would hit the, the, the return. But we think um, the food scandal is past us, and, and um, we won't see that again. Yeah. Uh, and I'd just like to add, I think th there is a little bit of the timing mismatch in terms of they, as you can see in 2012, they, they opened over 1,200 stores, and that's really boosted up their capex. And then just as they spent all that capex, you have the food, multiple food scandals in 13 and 14 that have dropped sales. And we think over time as sales stabilize that, 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 can be, that the returns can be improved upon. Sure. So um, I would like to, you know, first of all, we had this doubt as well um, when we first started the, the research. So, you know, but our value at the research and also our customer survey suggests that people still treat Yum, Yum China as a very valuable brand. You know, they come here for convenience, um, for, for its taste, and for its safe food. And I would also like to point out that uh, in China, the KFC and Pizza Hut are actually quite different. In China, KFC and Pizza Hut serve more of a middle class millennial population versus here, it's probably a different demographics. So, um, and these millennials, they actually value uh, food safety and when you live in an environment when you need to worry about food safety issue every day, you would like to trust an international brand like Yum 
Yum China and that you trust their supply chain. So you know, we think going forward, still, you know, the customer base would still be strong and loyal to Yum China, and you know, added the digital strategy um, that engage you know over a yeah. hundred million fans on social media, sort of engaging the the target group that they um, that they are targeting, and. So we think the delivery can also bring in a lot of growth yeah. uh, for the same store sales. Yeah, and I'd just like to emphasize, and add on, adding to that point, emphasize on the digital part of it. I think that's one of our main theses in terms of how they're going to grow comp in the future. I think it can't be understated the fact that they're really, in terms of digital and loyalty in the QSR, they're really the only game in town. They have 70 million members in KFC and 30 million members in Pizza Hut, and that's a powerful. There's a lot of powerful data that's being generated there. And we think that they're going to be using it. And indeed, in the last quarter um, report, they've been seeing some gains in that in terms of menu innovation and getting direct feedback from their loyalty members. So we think that that will continue. And another thing I would like to add is also compared to other Western QSR, you know, such as McDonald's and Burger King, Yum China has actually done a good job in localizing its menu. Its menu actually has a lot of Chinese items on there. So um, as Yum China expands into a second, third tier city, you know, these cities, people still should prefer there's some Chinese uh, fusion food, if you may, in, in the Western QSR. We, we think actually Yum China is better positioned than other competitors such as McDonald's, Burger King. How's that? Yeah. Uh, slide 36 shows that Yum is positioned as a premium offering among uh, QSR concepts. Uh, question is, uh, how do you think, how, what does that mean for the economic sensitivity of uh, consumption relative to growth patterns in China? And how do you think about uh, risk adjusting the, that forecast based on some of the difficulties of getting reliable growth statistics in China and, and uh, um, the, the volatility that we've seen in, in China's growth rates? First of all, the ticket price of Yum China is relatively cheap among Western QSRs. And Yum and, and KFC become more and more acceptable compared with local mom and pops. If you can see the price increase Kager for KFC is three to four percent every year. And the price increase Kager for mom and pops is seven to eight percent every year. So Yum become relatively cheap. Uh, I think this will help when the economy is, is going down because Yum has loyalty members and customer base. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think dinner is served out there. Uh, the judges are going to uh, postpone having dinner so we can judge. Uh, and then we'll come out and uh, pick a winner. Um, so I was hungry listening to the food presentation, but I'm going to have to have to wait. Uh, one other point I want to make, I forgot to, which is uh, our host tonight uh, is the Center for Jewish History. That's the building that we're in. Just to tell you a little bit about this organization, this is an organization which sort of the... Uh, Library of Congress, it's sort of the archival history of the Jewish people, and lots of interesting, you know, 100 million documents, various kinds of archives, uh, and we're very grateful uh, that they give us this uh, beautiful venue uh, each year. And I'm sure they would, you know, as you make lots of money in the investment business, you know, this is a philanthropically supported organization, so I'm sure they're looking for a nice contribution from every one of you. But not today. Today, you're the center's guests. Enjoy dinner. <laughs> okay.